I'm Loki Karuna, and this is Triloquy. Thanks for tuning in. Boy, oh boy, are there some things to talk about. <laughs> Shout out to Scott. This makes me miss those old days because he and I would have completely unpacked this recent uh, earshot <laughs> around the world. Does this mean that the uh, American Composers Orchestra needs to rethink the name of its composer advancement programs? You know, I, I run a, a program called Earshot. Mm, mm, mm. Anyway, I'll offer a few, a few words on uh, on that at attempted assassination following today's interview feature, which is my chat with the incomparable Marcus Norris. So Marcus has actually been on the show before. If you go back to Opus 118 of the Triloquy podcast all the way back in 2021, you can hear what he was up to then. Uh, but he's returned to offer and update us on some of his activities. I'll read a little about Marcus just to warm you up in case you don't know who he is. So it says here on his website, Marcus Norris's first foray into making music came in the form of producing rap beats on pirated software <laughs> installed on a Windows 98 computer that he MacGyvered together from spare parts while lying on the floor of his childhood bedroom. Though he came to composing concert music later, he transferred that same imagination and ingenuity to writing music of all kinds. This cross-genre mastery resulted in Beyonce asking Marcus to orchestrate several songs for her and a 50-piece orchestra as part of her surprise 2023 Dubai return to live performance. Miss Tina Knowles Lawson, that's Beyonce's mother for folks who don't know, also chose Marcus as music director for the 2022 Wearable Art Game. Gala with Marcus and the Southside Symphony performing as the onstage orchestra, accompanying Chloe and Halle Bailey, Andre Day, and many others. I mean, he had me at Beyonce, but of course, Marcus has done so much more, including leading the extremely innovative Southside Symphony that's mentioned there, which he founded back in 2020. So in this chat, Marcus and I talk about all of his work, some of his new collaborations with some of the nation's biggest classical institutions and he also offers some insights for the uh, so-called emerging composers, who I know a lot of people don't like that word emerging, but so-called emerging composers who are trying to get on just as he has. Really grateful to be able to share this really, really great dialogue with you. To get us into my chat with Marcus Norris, we're going to listen to one of his own compositions. This one's called I Tried So Hard For You. Uh, Jonna Wu is featured here on violin with pianist Andrew Zhou. Hope you enjoyed this snippet of this Marcus Norris composition, and I hope you enjoy my chat with him. See you on the other side. So the approach I have now for creating is like, I'm just going to make what I want and I'm going to talk about it more is new for me. It's like talk about the work and then this is going to allow like-minded people to find me. Sometimes those like-minded people will come from the classical space. Sometimes they won't. Um, so that's kind of my approach right now is like make your things and make as much of it as you can. Uh, collaborate with all the like-minded people that you can. Um, you know, I, I mentioned before, it's like I've been asked to do some things with Southside Symphony that I don't think is necessarily what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I never take offense to it at all. And I always take like, OK, cool. I haven't done a good job of uh, explaining those differences and those nuances um, first. And then secondly, I, I kind of think about it like, OK, yeah, doing X, Y, Z might be like a lot of eyeballs on it on me, but it's like, if those eyeballs are coming to me for things that I don't really have an interest in doing, then is that, is that helpful? Maybe not. Um, yeah. Yeah. but it, I also think that there's, it depends on where you're at. Like when I was first starting out, it's like, 
I think you know, like I didn't even know what it what it was, and I and I still am not sure that I do. You know, so just try all the things. If it interests you, try it. So what is it that you and I'll and I'll include the Southside Symphony since you mentioned them. What is it that y'all are trying to do? Is it to create a space for us? Is it to change the existing space? How do you see what you're creating on on that level, on that broader scale, as far as impact? I think I'm I'm trying to focus on what I what um I would say it's not like I I, I would say it's trying to create our own space and, and cr make space for the things we love and celebrating the music we love and the musicians we love, uh creating a lot of space and opportunity for black musicians. My my thing I, I talk a lot with all the players is like I want Southside to be like a place you can bring your whole self because it's like so often it's like you play in these classical spaces, but you can't do X, Y, Z. Um, when I was in in undergrad and, you know, having to play classical piano, I would get like yelled at for like tapping my foot. And I'm like, how can you not? Like, you know, you know what I mean? I'm like, it's it, it's moving. And, and that's my relationship with music. And or we just did a concert that was um, it was called like Black Music and Anime. And it was just all about this culture exchange between Black Americans and East Asian cultures, and and um, but it's just such a specific and and you know used to be nerdy thing, but it's like I, I wanted all of these people to be able to come and bring your whole self to these to these spaces. And when you talk about those intersections of what Black folks are interested in and do, you know, you're talking about the anime. Of course, it goes without saying all these Black folks play instruments, conservatory trained. It, it seems like the conversation that we really need to have is what we're, and it sounds weird to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway, what we're excluding versus what we're including. Because as again, as you've said, a Black person bringing their whole self to a space includes their love of anime. Maybe it includes their love of Brahms and Beethoven. So what is it that you're trying to keep out? Maybe there's some systems or some ways of thinking that don't really have a place in what you're creating as a composer and as the leader of the Southside Symphony. I, I think the exclusionary nature, I think the like, um, I, I would say a lot of the toxicity that comes with a lot of like the conservatory. Like um, I, I'm one of the things I'm most proud of is like the community of musicians at Southside and like the environment, like it doesn't feel like a lot of the other things we do where there's like, um, you know, competition between all the people that are there with you. I, I was, uh, I'm like, you all got the gig already. We're all here. Any mistake that happens is mine <laughs> for, for you know, I mean, like, uh, OK, cool. You're sight reading this. That's my fault because <laughs> I just got it to you today. You know what I mean? So it's just like we're good. And, and um, you know, it's, it's like a family. And so I don't know. I, I just I, I try to think about it now, like early when like in my 20s, I was a lot more angry and, and I still am sometimes. <laughs> but but like now in my 30s, I'm more like I, I try to focus on like, all right what are we celebrating like like and what is like um i had a, a good friend of mine tell me like with all the potential matches in the world why spend any time focusing on a non-match yeah. and and so i'm like uh you know um I, i'm just trying to lean into the specificity into the authenticity these days it's like i'm not writing for blank 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 i'm, I'm writing for loki i'm writing for so and so i'm writing for these very specific people and i think you can't go wrong now so what helped you get over that anger that you were uh, describing? Because I think, you know, I, I'm, I also had my angry black man era. Maybe I'm not <laughs> out of it. But how, how did how did you traverse the ecosystem as it is next to really getting yourself in an emotional, maybe even spiritual place to put forward the best that you have to offer? I, I mean, to your point, I think you never really leave the angry black man state. You just you kind of add in more parts to your whole self, I think. And for me, it is just focusing on that love. Like it is just focusing on um, the, the people that pour into you. It's like, it's like, yes, there are a lot of people. Um, oh, you don't get this opportunity you think you should get. Or yes, they're keeping you out of X, Y, Z space or whatever. But it's like, I, you know, I, I'm working with so many amazing musicians and, and, and that's a blessing. And, and, uh, touching people and audiences and you know like like when we just did that 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 black anime concert was the most recent one and it's like 
there were people there and like just they, as soon as I walked out like I had a I wore like a Spike Spiegel suit it's from Cowboy Bebop anybody oh, yeah. who knows those it's like it's like as soon as I walked out lost their mind you know what I mean and, and I had to stay afterwards talking about it for like 90 minutes like about all the different things it's just like I like these they hadn't got to talk about these things and like um you know black folks came in like uh you know like full-on gear like cosplay and stuff or uh you know we did i did an opera recently and like people were like i've never even been to an opera before i never had an interest in going mm -hmm. to an opera before so it's like yes i can focus on these old folks who are stuck in these specific ways. And we do have to talk about those things and we do have to navigate those things and do that work. But it's like, for my mental health even, it's like, I, I find it's it's more helpful. It's been uh, a proportionate amount of time focusing on the love. Well, I definitely want to give folks who aren't as familiar with you and your work an opportunity to uh, be caught up, especially since your last appearance on the Triloquy podcast. But one thing that I did want to make sure that I asked you was about Beyonce, since the last time you were on uh, uh, Triloquy, <laughs> you got the opportunity to orchestrate one of those shows. Please, how did that happen? How, how did you get there? Yeah, no, that's you. You have to talk about the Beyonce. It's just, it's just uh, any, any chance I get, I'll talk about the Beyonce. Um, so I have been uh, scoring like theater plays uh, with Waco Theater in North Hollywood, um, and it's owned by Tina Knowles. And I've been doing that since maybe like 2018. I think it was the first one. Like I like I recommend to all the young composers, just like just try all the thing. I had no interest or background in theater. Um, oh, hold on. did my video stop? Let me see. Oh, there, there it is. Go. There we go. Sorry about that. Oh no worries. Um, I had no interest or background in theater, but I just tried it and I liked it a lot. And anyway, so that path took me to working at Waco Theater for years. Um, and now those are like my family. And then in 2022, Miss yeah. Tina did the wearable art gala. A short walk before getting back to your Sorry. Uh, oh, you're good. Alexa. Uh, in, in 2022, Miss Tina had asked me, um, to be the music director for her wearable art gala. And, um, so me and Southside Symphony performed, I, I had, it was like, uh, this was before Renaissance came out. But the theme was like, you know, a re renaissance, Harlem renaissance. And so I was in like this Cab Calloway suit and we had like, you know, I think like a 18 piece all black Southside Symphony Orchestra. We performed with Andrew Day, Chloe and Halle. And then we did all of the like, like all the walk on, walk off music live. Um, and it was crazy. And, and uh, but like soon after that, uh miss tina like so you know uh so the wearable art gala it's like all of black hollywood and music they all go to this to this thing and um beyonce was there um and then like soon after that like miss tina was like she called me and i'm like the busiest I've ever been in my life at this point I, i'm working on my uh my phd dissertation defense miss tina calls me it's around the holidays she's like what are you doing these days Bold face lied. I was like, nothing, Miss Tina. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> period, period. I was like, I was like, nothing. I was like, <laughs> absolutely I'm sitting on my hands. Um, and then she started talking to me. She was like, you know, Beyonce is gonna be doing this like first concert she's done in like five years, and she's going to Dubai, and it's gonna they're gonna have this orchestra. I think you should meet her. I think you should, I think you should help with this. And I was like, I, I was like almost speechless. I I'm like, I I would love to. I'd be honored to. And you know, and so it was kind of a maybe. Um, and then they they brought me on. They worked on it in L.A. And um, I did like one orchestration as like a test run, uh, and that went well. And then so they had me like do some other things. I, it was like really really quickly though, and. Um, so it was like at the last minute, as all these things often were, but it was like so cool, man. It was uh, amazing. <laughs> get, get in good with the mom. That's what my mom always taught me. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong there. <laughs> so if I remember correctly, last time you were on Triloquy, you were talking about how creating uh, mixtapes and beats and that sort of theme was your entry into this thing called composition. I wonder if you could remind us all about 
the bridge between being at home, doing whatever you're doing and orchestrating for Beyonce, having your own orchestra, all of those things. Was there a, a big break? Was there a performance that did it for you? What, what, what created who you are now as a creator? Yeah. So uh, the short answer is there is no break. There is no like clear line. I always like tell people is like when you look back, there looks like there's a clear line or like some genius plan I had. But when you're going through things, you're just going through it blind. And I think that's helpful for young folks to know is like make the best decisions you can. Um, my specific path was that I, you know, I grew up making beats and rapping my on my uncles, Nate and Dre got me started when I was 13, which is uh, 20 years ago this year, which is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, and, I, and I, I thought that's what I was going to do. I love doing it. And um, I, I didn't have plans to go to college. And then I found out my friends were going to college. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, come on, guys. I thought we were hanging out. And then um, I got a two-year scholarship to a community college. They were giving out this thing at that time for like low-income students. And so I got two years to a community college. So I just scoured the internet for like community college that had like music recording, anything related to it. Um, and then I ended up at uh, Schoolcraft College outside Detroit. Uh, but while I was there, I got, I had, they made me take like basic materials in music theory and like music history. And I started like learning about these guys, learned about Bach. And I was like, oh my God, I've never, I've never like heard any music that like was stacking itself on top of each other in these really complicated ways. And like, I just got bit by the bug. And then you start learning about, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and all these guys. Um, and I ended up taking like all of music theory. And then so when I was going to leave there, I was going to keep going for audio production. But at the last minute, I switched uh, to composition and then just been going ever since um i did a bachelor's of music in at uh columbia chicago in, in composition and while i'm but while i'm there i'm also like producing for a lot of artists outside of school um i worked with tink i worked with rhyme fest uh, a bunch of chicago cats um that did my master's in composition at uh florida international in miami and then I just finished my uh, PhD at UCLA. You know, one of the things that I think about when you talk about your trajectory, number one, is a, a tune of yours, I think it's called Out Cheer. And it, <laughs> it, it makes me think about the degree to which you were out here, you were outside <laughs> while getting these degrees, while, while doing this thing. You know, so many uh, black musicians, uh, including composers, I would say, get caught into this sort of circle of, you know, you're in music school. That means you're hanging out with certain types of people with certain histories, certain sensibilities. And slowly, you know, these folks sort of uh, phase out of being in community in the way that you have been. I wonder if you attribute where you are now at, at these unique intersections to your maintaining those relationships and that work, you know, creating stuff for artists, making beats, all of these things while you were in school. It's, it's obvious that you were not focused on counterpoint and all of those things exclusively. You were, it feels like you were trying to maintain two sides of a coin that, you know, you, you've really created into one coin, one side of a coin for yourself. No, a hundred percent. And I think that's spot on. I think that's like one of my advice uh, for young composers is just like, um, don't think like, okay, I'm going to finish school and, and, and then I'm going to start my career. It's like, you got to start now, man. Um, it, because I think the community is the valuable part um and, and starting building those relationships and building those skills of working with people come becoming a better collaborator i was thinking about it recently is that like i, I don't know maybe like 98 percent of my projects are collaborative in some way shape or form um so i think you you build a lot of skills just working with people and and being somebody that people want to work with yeah yeah there there's so many uh folks who want to be in community musically in the way that you are. But as I was mentioning, had just sort of phased out over the years and those relationships were sort of lost. What would you say to the the black musician who wants to develop a relationship with 
rappers, with MCs, or or just folks d- uh, around the corner? You know, what what are those steps that you would suggest they take? I would say think about what can I give versus yeah. what can I get. It is like I think that's one of the big big missteps I see that that you know everybody makes at some point in time. Um, is especially like if you're if you're feeling a scarcity, it is like what can I give? How can I be of service? And that's the easiest way is like, how do I make a lot of friends, um, musician friends now? I hire them. <laughs> it's like, you know what I mean? I just posted this Duke Ellington interview. Uh, somebody said like, they were asking him like, how do you you keep a, a band together? And he was like, ah, you need a gimmick. He was like, my gimmick is I give them money, you know? <laughs> and, and and that doesn't have to be it. But I, but I just mean like, um, like, so like early on, it's like, okay, I can write you a piece that showcases you that it's like you like I, I was always trying to write music that like is fun to play is rewarding to play if it's challenging like um, not just challenging for the sake of being challenging and then um, and then the audience will uh, praise you or you know get the the musician the performer after they play it like you know what I mean so it's like and and if you're a musician maybe you can I can play keys on this person's track or like hey maybe we can. Uh, would you ever be interested in performing together live with with some mus- musicians or something like whatever that is? Just think about like, what are the skills that I have um, and what can I offer to people? And I think approaching it that way, like being of service to people, I think you you can't lose. I, I want to talk about some of your recent uh, successes and projects, you know, your map premiere. We have Lady in the Lake to talk about your uh, collaboration with Atlanta Opera. But before we get into those things specifically, I wonder if you can connect the dots between being community connected, being culturally competent through your creations and getting connections and work from these brick and mortar, quote unquote, traditional institutions. I imagine a lot of people see them being completely separate. But again, you've you've managed to melt them together. Is it this work from your perspective that got you on the the radars of uh, of Juilliard and Atlanta Opera and these other institutions? I I think of them all like I'm offering them all um, parts of me. I do think I remember we, we we like sent a list of questions and part of it was about like, is there like those challenges in breaking it down? And I will say, like, I, I don't want to paint the wrong picture for any like young composers and stuff. It's very hard. And what happens is that one of the the hurdles to jump over is that like um, these spaces often only um, respect or value work in those spaces, which is really hard. Right. Like. Um, it's like so. What you written for Juilliard? It's like I can't let you compose for no TV because you haven't composed for no TV. <laughs> and there's like, and there's that, you know, the the systematic like racism and exclusion that I, I've heard you talk about a lot happens there, where it's like this this gatekeeping and that like, yeah, but it's like, well, how do I get the first one if you won't let me? If you won't let me do that, you you know what I mean? And um, but I I think what's helped me is like I. I is like you said, being able to leverage them somehow, some ways, like, and I think I, what I try to do is just lean into my uniqueness, like, um, and the things that make me unique. Um, so it's like, Hey, if, and and then I bring all of it to all of it. Like, um, one thing I, I think I'm really proud of is that like, when I got my first film score, a bunch of black musicians played on their first film score. Mm-hmm. And you know what I mean? And and when I got my first TV score, a bunch of black musicians played on their first TV score because because I fought for that. I'm like, I'm like, we like, cool. You want Marcus Norris sound on this, this unique sound that I've been able to develop. That sound is these people and you can't separate it. And so I can't do it unless these people can do it, you know. Um, so I think you, I think you bring the community with every as many as you can, you know, Um and you you just bring your whole self to all of these things. How much of a battle is that? Do you feel like you have to send the email three times and then get on a Zoom? <laughs> or, or are the folks like, okay, that makes sense? It just depends on the space, right? Um, and, and I don't know, like it, it can be a battle. <laughs> like it can be a battle, man. Like like it it shouldn't always, but but sometimes it is. 
um, just depending on the project, depending on the space. Um, but you you got to decide what matters for you and what are the things that that you're passionate about and what are the, the sticky points for you? What, what are the battles worth fighting? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and and I choose mine and, and, and lean into them really heavy. You know, like you said, uh, we were talking about earlier, like you don't always you don't completely lose the angry black man phase. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if you'll talk a little bit about uh, Lady in the Lake. What 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 is this project and what's what's been the process of your delivering what they're looking for? Yeah. Uh, so Lady in the Lake, it's a new TV series coming out on uh, Apple and stars Natalie Portman and Moses Ingram. It takes place in like late 60s, black Baltimore. Um, and it's uh, me and Southside Symphony's first TV score, man. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to uh, open a lot of doors for uh, for a lot of us. Um, the music I'm really, really, really proud of. Uh, worked on it for a year, which is not the normal. Um, but Hollywood had those double strikes last year, and those were on the production side. And music comes in at post production, um, and so we kind of they were like, "All right, well, y'all can just keep working on it." And I'm like, "Oh my god, I have to do something different." Um, but what I'm really excited about musically is that like it's just really, really complicated. Um, compared to like the music is just really complex and nuanced compared to like a lot of what we te think of as like TV score now where um, right now the trend is for it to kind of be like wallpaper um, that you don't really notice. Um, this music is really complex and they even like licensed a few of my classical pieces in there. Um, I'm, I'm just really excited about it. Uh, they're going to put the soundtrack out the same day. Apple's really excited about the music, which is an uh, uh, ego boost. <laughs> So how does it work logistically? Do they send you clips of the show and you decide what the aesthetic on the visuals that you're getting? Do you read a script? How, 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 what is that like? What is that process? So I work with the director. So the director makes all the final say versus like um, when I'm writing a concert piece, it's like I just write whatever is on my heart that day. Right. And and for film and TV, it's like you're working with the director and it kind of has to like filter through their understanding and like, what are their goals? Because like, say, say we're looking at the same scene, there's a million ways you could approach that musically. Even if it's just a conversation between two people, it's like, okay, should the music represent Loki's emotions? Should it represent Marcus's emotions? Mm -hmm. Should it represent the environment and how the environment is? Should we be from the audience's perspective and how the audience might feel? And that doesn't even count for like instruments or style or, you know what I mean? So there's just so many approaches. So I was working directly with the director, um, Alma Harrell, and um, we were working together for a long time. We were in the in the, in the trenches on this one. Um, but I think we made something super unique. From the beginning, she was just like, um, like she turned down like a lot of music that I thought was really, really good. And, but the good thing for me is like, I just, like I said, you, you have to get those skills of collaboration. So I can be, I am good at being like, okay, cool. Like this idea is not right for this. She's not saying this is bad music or I'm bad or whatever. So I'm like, okay, cool. No sunk cost. We just, just jump right to the next thing. And I'm like, but we'll put these over here. Those will come out as like South side records or, or something like that. Um, yeah, but but she turned down a lot of stuff and she was like, look, any other director would be happy to get this. She was like, but I want to just something, the word she kept saying was iconic. She was like, I want iconic, I want, I want this world to have its own sound that doesn't sound like anything else um, and not be something that you could put on another show and it just work. It's like, it sounds like this. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really proud of it. So does creating something that's iconic, especially when we're talking about the uniqueness of black Baltimore in the 60s, the uniqueness of who you are, the South Side Symphony, are there parameters that you feel like you have to break outside of when it comes to scoring? And I guess what I'm thinking about specifically is instrumentation. I would imagine that somewhere in the I haven't watched the, sh the show yet, obviously, but somewhere in this score is something beyond double winds, strings, orchestral percussion, you know, how, how do you how do you expand what even the orchestra is in this type of collaboration? So what was dope for me and like I believe that like I believe when you are just working on your things, there will be 
uh, the universe conspires for like these very specific opportunities to come for you. And I felt that about this, like for the Beyonce, one of the tunes we did was um, like, we did some of her music, obviously, but one tune we did was just Schubert's Ave Maria. And, and not like the remix she did back in the day, Beyonce just before, it was just literal Schubert's Ave Maria. But it was like, when that opportunity came to do, I'm like, I'm making it like R and B and but it's intricate classical string writing. I'm like, this is an opportunity for me. It was made for me. I grew up on on the R and B, but went to school for all this. And and I felt that way about this as well, uh, Lady in the Lake, because it was like, this is what we do with, with Southside Symphony. We live in that fusion world. Like there's like the Motown soul. Mm -hmm. Uh so South so um Southside Symphony, we have like uh jazz rhythm trio um string orchestra and then like brass and winds but we have like saxophones uh like like it's kind of modeled after the old uh soul records like yeah um and so it just was like i'm like who i'm like it's made for this world where like we knew we didn't want it to go all the way like we knew early on because there's this juxtaposition of like um the Jewish characters, uh, like Natalie Portman's character and Black Baltimore, we knew really early on we never wanted it to be a simple dichotomy. It's, oh, oh, I'm with Black people. Get out your trumpet. Yeah. Oh, we're with these people. Get out. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, I'm like, no, it's like it's going to be a lot more nuanced in, than this. Um, it's all a fusion. Um, and so I just, I just felt like, I, I feel like when the right opportunities come for you, it's like you do have to work and like rise up to them but you feel like prepared uniquely in some ways. And this felt like that for me. And first of all, I have to tip my hat to you for, you know, really knowing your Beyonce history, because a lot of the kids don't remember. I am Sasha Fierce and the Ave Maria <laughs> that was on that album. <laughs> what my man say, say uh, uh, do your homework exactly. Exactly. <laughs> on Beyonce. And I don't want to leave anything up for assumption it sounds like these skills that you're able to bring in, you know, these different sounds, you develop these skills while you were working with the folks, while you were outside in tandem with being in music school, or were you learning, you know, how to integrate saxophone and 808s and all these stuff. And, and I, I just want to make sure that the, the record is clear. <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, I think these things all come from being curious. Like, mm -hmm. like even if you have amazing, um, in structures, which I did have a lot of really good teachers, but like almost everything I do, m most of the fields I work in, I learned outside of school and, and not just in like these projects I had my hands in, but also like just being a curious person. Like I, I like I do so, so, so much score study um, and I transcribe things. And so my approach to kind of music theory is just like, I like this. Why? Let me figure out why. And I've been like that since I was a kid. Um, it, it, I remember like back in the day trying to like recreate beats and stuff. We didn't have YouTube at that time. So it was just like, it was just like, ah, how did he get that sound? And what does this knob do? Let me turn it up. So I think um, pursue your interest would be my advice. Like whatever, whatever you like. And then you don't know when it's going to come in handy. Like, you, you know, I wasn't was I studying Sasha Fierce? No, I just was just like absorbing as much of it as I could and and figuring it out. And it's like, oh, okay, that came in handy 20 years, whatever many years later, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you have to, you have to take charge and like control. Like I, I was joking a lot about it because I, I graduated recently uh, with my PhD, relatively recently. And, but I was like, oh yeah, I, I'm so happy to be done with school. So now I can really study music. You know, <laughs> no, no I, I hear you. I definitely hear you. So as we were talking about earlier, you know, you're doing these big things in more popular culture, but you haven't turned your back on the so-called classical industry completely. I mean, uh, we, we could talk about Atlanta Opera. We can talk about your premiere with uh, uh, the MAP students here in, in New York. Why is it important for you to still have one hand on the on the ecosystem, as it were? Because I love it. I'm, I'm operating out of a, a out of a love for all of it. And and I think like. I, I don't know, I think there are things that that space and that tradition of of that structured studying, um, I, I think they can make. 
great art. You, you you know what I mean? And especially like I'm especially passionate about the young dogs, like with the, the young students, because it's like I just think about like, man, how cool would it be to have like just some black cool music that represented culture or, or like had some type of relevance to your life outside of that as well, you know? Um, yeah, I'm so passionate about it because I still love it. And and I think there are, are unique things that it can do that other mediums can't necessarily do. So for folks who don't know, you know, we're, we're saying MAP, we're talking about the music advancement program. I wonder if you write differently. I mean, obviously you write differently in some ways for kids versus professionals, but is the is the through line the same? Is what you want them to think about the same or or different? How do you how do you approach the more cognitive side of working with up and coming musicians? Yeah, I think I, I mean on a technical aspect, like you said, it, it's a little different, um, but not crazy because it's like not crazy different because um a lot of times I'm writing music, like for me, orchestral music specifically is like, I try to write parts that like a professional can sight read the individual parts. Mm -hmm. But the interesting part is how does it all fit together? Interesting. Um, for orchestral music, chamber music, I love as well. And you get to be more intricate and you get to do all these things. But like for modern professional is like a, a good professional can sight read these parts and then, but when it comes together, it just makes this thing that's like, and, and if you look at like all the great orchestrators, um, Ravel is like one of my, my favorite is like m orchestra parts. It's like a lot of it is, is for most of it, it's like a professional player can, can sight read a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. but you put it together and then it's just like, whoa. Um, so I try to approach that for the students as well, where, um, it's just the, the level is of uh, maybe a little bit different, but I still am approaching it like philosophically, co conceptually, like how I approach everything is like, I want when you play a Marcus Norris piece, you feel like a rock star. Like, like I sound great. Oh, here's my part. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to give everybody a part, like whether they can kind of shine and it's a good time. Like, like it's community for the musicians as much as it is for uh, the audience. Um, and I, I just, I don't know. I, that's, I, that's what I like. Cause that's what they do. <laughs> and look, let's just say it. You aren't walking in there in front of these students looking like Carlton Banks. You know, you have a little <laughs> wag about you and that can't be something that you take for granted, especially as these young musicians are sort of looking at what life could look like for them if they stay on this journey. No, a hundred percent. It's like, I always say like, it's just a not, I, I talked a lot about this with the Atlanta Opera or all these things. It's just like, it's got to be cool. Like, like I, I'd rather not do it than it not be cool. You know what I mean? Like, just full stop. I can't. I can't. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to talk about Juilliard, but I think Atlanta Opera is a sort of different fish to fry, so to speak, because not only is this an arts institution and an arts institution steeped in tradition it's one of these institutions in wakanda it's in the black <laughs> capital of, of, of the united states i wonder how you approached your collaboration with them with all of those things in mind again balancing who's outside versus what you've been commissioned to do what you've been asked to do yeah i mean it's like i i, I really wanted to like it to be a black story i wanted the language like it's my first like uh, opera that's being commissioned in this way. And I'm still finding out my relationship with opera. I didn't grow up with a relationship with opera. Um, so I wanted to write something for people like me. Um, you don't you don't necessarily have to know all the backstory and all the stuff in order to still enjoy it. I'm going to do that studying like I'm going to you know, I'm engaging with that repertoire. Um, I'm not like disregarding it or like, uh, so vain that I, I think I can just, you know, invent the wheel myself or, or whatever, but it's like, I, I don't want you to have to know all that in order to enjoy it. Um, and, and it was really, really important to make the people like talk like people where I'm from. That was one of my things. Like I, I, I knew opera from Bugs Bunny, but I just always think like, why do they, I can't understand what they're saying. Why do they talk like that? <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, so I, I just wanted it to be welcoming in that way rather than. Ex and, and I also it was really important to me that it just like just a good time. Like I like a lot of times I think 
I think um, artistic projects can be like, it, it almost is like about the talking about it is the thing. Like yeah. the lecture about it or the paper about it or the think piece that you write it is the thing. And it's like, no, you just, just come, uh, this producer, I like no ID. He has this quote, speakers don't lie. And, and or, or uh, another producer, Tricky Stewart says like, you can't intellectualize yourself into a hit. Like, like you, you just, you press play, do people react to that? And that was my test. I was like, I was like, I just want to make something that it's like, you play this for people who came up like me um, from, from our communities, from the black communities in this, in this space. And they react to it. If not, then it's like, I still have work to do. Um, so that, that was, I definitely wanted it to be welcoming in that way. And as much baggage as there is around what opera is, especially folks who don't frequent that sort of environment, there are benefits, uh, namely just there being narrative. It's not musical notes that people have to interpret or even react to find that, you know, that there's a story to be told. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. What's the narrative behind this collaboration with Atlanta Opera? Yeah, so I worked with Adama Ibo and she wrote the book and the story. We kind of we kind of split the uh the division of labor. Um so for people who don't know, usually in opera there's a libretto, a librettist, and a composer. Mm -hmm. And the librettist will write all the words and then the composer will write the music. But in musical theater, it's different. It's usually like there's a book writer, um, this is like the dialogue in these things, there's a lyricist, um, who writes the songs, the words for the songs, and then and then there's a music buyer, a composer. So I did the music and the lyrics, and Adama wrote the story uh, brilliantly. Um, there are basically are there are puddles that are popping up all around Forsyth County in Georgia, um, but they're supernatural in nature. It's like they you can't mop these puddles up; they're not drying up ever, and they're popping up like just in the middle of like an office, and like one pops up in like an old folks' home. And, uh, you know, a community center, a school, wherever. Um, and so he hires this private detective and this gray witch to get to the bottom of it. Like somebody figure out why this is happening. Um, and by the end, they kind of like uncover like some dark history uh, that happened in Georgia that a lot of Georgia folks know about. Um, but it's unfortunately not an uncommon uh occurrence in this country that's inc that's incredible it, it's given afrofuturists it's, it's given <laughs> black science fiction that there, there's so much in it so when it comes to you know all of these different communities that we've already talked about is this opera one that you feel like anyone you've ever engaged can sit down and enjoy it, it sounds like it's the case but i feel like sometimes even for black folks who have come up through music we can take for granted that sometimes something is just too long sometimes something is just not absolutely interesting and and uh, of, of course i'm sure you have a, a full confidence in this piece of music but i guess really the question i ask is how do you make sure that you're you're keeping that mindset when you are creating, how do you make sure that this opera, as as we're talking about it here, is something that is accessible not only to the Atlanta Opera's exi existing audience, but us as well? Sure. Yeah. Uh, for me, um, well, on, on the length of opera, so I was like, this is a one act. You get an hour. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, you know, maybe there might be a if it becomes a different story in the future. I'm not opposed to expanding it. Um, but to, to your, your second question is like, how do I make sure this is engaging for our communities? I just think about, I always do this. I'm always thinking about sp specific people I know. Like, like, would my dad enjoy this? Would my cousins enjoy this? Like, would my, and they are not, they have no relationship with classical music um, mm -hmm. as I didn't before. And I, and so I'm always thinking about specific people. And I think that's that's how you uh, that's how you stay authentic. Um, author Tim Ferriss talks about that when he writes books. He says, I'm always thinking about two very specific people, uh, readers. And it's like I'm writing it so that they would get value from this. And I, I kind of do the same thing with music where it's just like that. That's my that's my North Star. 
I love that. That's brilliant. Well, unlike what you said to Tina Knowles, I'm sure you have a lot other things <laughs> going on. How can folks learn more about uh, all your upcoming uh, activities and performances? So the best way is just like my website or like we have like a newsletter. It's just marcusnorris.com or southsidesymphony.org. And then uh, I'm pretty active on Instagram. It's just at Marcus Norris. There are a lot of people out here, you know, I, I know composers don't really like this word emerging. I think the, the the industry is moving away from it. But for the sake of this question, you know, there are a lot of so-called emerging composers out there who really just want that orchestral performance, who really want to, you know, make a living as a composer, but in that traditional way, in that quote unquote traditional framework. Do you think that time is up or do you see from your perspective pathways toward today's composers existing in the same in at least similar ways as Stravinsky, William Grant Still, anyone that you can think of in the 20th century? I would say like for a very small amount of people, like and now especially if you are black, then it's like and then within that, you know, within that very small amount of people who get to do that, Two of y'all. they <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They decide that there's like only really like two of y'all. We we have two black slots is how I think those meetings go. <laughs> I'm not in those meetings, but that's how I think they go. So and then my thing is just like um, I think about Hendrix. He didn't like to be praised because if some if people can build you up, they can take you down when you don't get that. And, and so my thoughts was like, if you if you rely on that system to kind of determine whether or not you have a career mm -hmm. um you know it, it's up to them like when they decide you don't you don't anymore um and so that would be my word of caution for that approach um that said it's not impossible and, and in pursuing that you might I, I would just say in pursuing that be open to other opportunities to come that may not look the way you think it should look maybe it's not an orchestra piece maybe it's your friend you know, uh, it's we're writing a piece for your friend's ensemble and then, oh, and now they're a soloist for this orchestra. So now maybe you can write them. You offer to write them a concerto uh, or whatever it is. You know, I would just say be open to it, not looking um, the way you think it should look. And then just pursue all your unique interest, because um, because at the end of the day, uh, later on, that's going to be your calling card. Like, oh, you're the guy who writes those weird fusion things. Or you're the guy who's really into blah, 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 you know. Um, and that at least, at least, um, makes you stand out in this crowd. You know, we started talking about, we started this conversation talking about, uh, what the composer wants versus marketability and, and all of those different variables. I want to loop back around to that in closing to talk a little bit about putting blackness forward. You know, we we talk a lot about, oh, well, there are different types of black, which which there are, which there are, you know, everyone should come forward in their genuine, authentic self. And whoever you are in this industry, we are fighting against a historical norm, against historical narratives. I wonder what would be your call to the black composer, the black musician, the black artist who's trying to negotiate how much of their blackness is appropriate for what they're trying to do. Again, considering the historical narratives around orchestral music, around being a composer. What, 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 what's, uh, what, what's your politic ar around that? For me, I'm always just like, look, if they would, if they wanted uh, a white composer, they would have hired a white composer. <laughs> they could have very easily. And that goes for any organization. If they wanted white musicians, they could have hired white musicians. Um, I, I say as long as you're doing it authentically, like for me, it's like, you, you know, um, I hire black musicians to play black music for black people. And it's like, I, I think I think as long as you're doing it authentically, I think you can't lose. You know what I mean? Um, bring your whole self. If they wanted somebody different, they would have got somebody different. <laughs>
That one's called I Don't Want Your Love. <laughs> you can find the full performance and information on the performers in the description. Beautiful work there by Marcus Norris. Again, so grateful to have him here on the Triloquy podcast. I uh, will also mention that Marcus has a bassoon piece, a piece for bassoon and piano that I had the pleasure and the honor of premiering back in 2022. I still owe him a studio version of, of that piece. So it's time for me to get my bassoon back out and take care of that. So uh, thanks so much, Marcus. Marcus, for all you're doing for the field. Can't wait uh, for everyone to give that music of yours an ear because it's really great. And speaking of ears, right, as uh, as we all know by now, Mr. Trump has uh, been the victim of an attempted assassination. I'm going to keep it trill for a second. I was a little tight because this happened the same day as I released my Tammy Kernodal feature last week. So all the algorithms were ignoring me. They were <laughs> focused on this big bit of news. That that was my first reaction if I'm just going to keep it real with y'all. But it's like that sometimes. All right. So let me uh, react to this a little bit. The first thing I think I'll say is that as a Buddhist, there's nothing that I consider more precious than human life. So that means I'm glad that the assassination attempt was only an attempt. I'm also uh, chanting for Matthew Crooks, I think his name is, because his life was also precious. So I'm sorry that he decided to make a cause that resulted in the effect of being killed by the Secret Service. But that's just what happened. That's cause and effect. And I'm Yohorenge Kyo. Well, it's a, a week later now, and we've seen MAGA people at uh, different events and even the Republican National Convention wearing ear bandages and quote unquote solidarity. <laughs> we've seen uh, Donald Trump pick a running mate. And now word on the street is that Biden might be stepping down, at least according to some of the rumor mills that I pay attention to. Um, on this 20th day of July, 2024, as I record this. But before I go on, I just want to make it clear that I'm by no means excited by either prospect. I don't care who the Democratic Party puts up. I'm not going to be excited by either prospect. On one side, we have a presidential candidate that I have no reason to believe will push back against some, if not all, of the tenants of Project 2025. Now, if you don't know what Project 2025 is, cut this off and go do your Googles and come back. All right, so that's one side. On the other hand, we have a whole political party that's taken the black vote for granted for a generation. And quite frankly, I don't think I have anything to show for black allegiance to the so-called political left. We aren't actually talking about reparations on, on a serious level. We aren't actually talking about student loan debt forgiveness that I believe American descendants of enslaved people have to deal with on a disproportionate level. I mean, there are people whose families, parents immigrated to the United States, and they don't even have to worry about that sort of thing. And my ancestors built this country, and I'm strapped with six-figure student loan debt. I mean, what is really going on? We, we aren't talking about these things. And most of all, we aren't talking about inflation and wages in the way that we need to. Now, what are we talking about? What we are talking about, from my perspective, is tax cuts for the rich and the maintenance of a system that coddles and rewards the highest earners. I mean, and that goes across political lines. There are statistics that say the 116th Congress was a majority millionaire Congress. Think about that. Most of the people representing our needs, representing our life, love, pursuit of happiness, have no idea what it's like in this year to really be struggling. Not to say that any of them never struggle, but if you're a millionaire now, you don't know what it's like to not be a millionaire now. I couldn't find the numbers for the current 118th Congress, but it's probably similar when we're talking about majority uh, millionaires, when you're talking about the lobbying and, you know, even the grassroots money that people put behind their candidates. It really skews things for me. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing all of this up because the longer I work in arts admin specifically, the longer I see how all of this trickles down. Who do y'all think keeps the lights on at an orchestra hall or in a concert house? I'm sorry to upset the musicians listening, but it's not ticket sales. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's people with deep pockets that, for whatever reason, decide that the tax breaks they get from funding classical music is benevolent and generally good for society. Now, I'm not going to argue hypothetical reasoning. You know, I, I know I say that, but I, I 
I'm, I can't really argue hypothetical reasoning that I can't definitively name from these people. But let's consider all of the political dialogue that's happening right now from a class perspective. As an arts professional, my job is to talk to institutions and get them to spend their money on living composers and new music initiatives while those same very institutions their job is to maintain or develop, as we say in the biz, relationships with the very communities of people who maintain the larger status quo of our economic reality. They do this by finding every way they can to keep their dollars untaxed or outside of our general taxable system, including putting their money through charitable and philanthropic giving structures. Now, I'm not going to say there is no good in that, but we really just have to look at the material and look at what's going on around us when it comes to why folks feel like they can't afford much less, you know, uh, uh, orchestra concert, uh, uh, opera ticket, but their groceries, their car notes, their rent, all of that. Now, of course, the counter argument I see is that, well, at least it's benefiting something, right? I mean, I won't be completely ungrateful for the dollars I earn to pay my bills, which largely comes from foundation support and philanthrop uh, philanthropic giving, but I'm definitely out here hustling. My nine to five helps me survive, but it doesn't create that reality in and of itself. This is where I want people to think as we approach, approach November, especially those of us who are in the arts and are just scraping by, or maybe even worse for some of us. You want to continue the tradition of so-called classical music as we know it, even by way of living composers and recentering contemporary aesthetics and perspectives and all those things. Well, you should probably vote for the candidate who's going to protect the pocketbooks of the folks who fund all of this. Now, do you want to be a revolutionary and struggle toward change, not only in the arts, but in the broader world? Well, I think you should understand that our government is here to maintain big business, private ownership, and a class system that oppresses most of us for the sake of the few. You should internalize the fact that the systems that protect those structures, including the prison, medical, military, and even nonprofit industrial complexes, must be challenged. The change isn't going to come from the government. The change isn't going to come from foundations who, at the end of the day, are tied to the state. The change is not going to come from, as Audre Lorde said, the master's tools won't di dismantle the master's house. It's time for us to start thinking radically and for us to start thinking more individually and not through individualism, but as what we can do to inspire change as individuals on the ground floor, on the, on the grassroots level, and organizing at least towards some consciousness around these ideas. This is not an overnight fix by any means, but it's my goal to cultivate as much consciousness, just as much understanding around these things as possible, as is, you know, it is the work of many others. Shout out to Justin Lang, who's helped me better understand some of these truths. And shout out to the countless people on the ground, people within institutions and all the folks in my DMs that are helping me develop a politic around all of this that I think can apply to the dismantling of the classical music industrial complex. You know, the point of this podcast years in again is to decolonize classical music. Well, that's that's still the goal. And we need to think about what decolonization isn't. It isn't taking this machine. It isn't taking these systems and painting it black or putting uh, more people of color, more marginalized folks on the stages. It's time for us to evolve and develop our thinking around what this looks like toward those bigger systems change, even outside of the arts. I want to shout out to you for at least thinking about what an unknown future could look like, because so many of us, and especially those in power, will swat down a critique of a thing if the solution isn't immediately obvious or the the, the new sort of status quo uh, can't really be understood. We have to imagine. We have to have to imagine. I'm really tired of this, and I hope you are too. Our generation will struggle against our caste system of economic class, or will lay down and let our oligarchy continue to enslave us, including those of us who have dedicated our lives to a colonial way of creating, sharing, and making music. Whew. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to y'all again soon. Peace.